Hello, Stingray freshmen. This video presentation is a freshman introduction. And today we're going to cover an introduction of the counselors. I'll review graduation requirements, talk about how final grades are calculated and how GPA is calculated. We'll discuss the PSAT, the SAT versus the ACT, dual enrollment eligibility, senior partial schedule eligibility, NCAA eligibility, Bright Futures eligibility. We'll wrap up with scholarships and your high school timeline. First up, we have Miss Felix. She is the counselor for students last names A through C. Here's Miss Thomas. She has students last names D through H. Miss Kandetsky, she has students last names I through MN. I'm Miss Moshek. I have students last names MO through SH. And here's Miss McIntosh. She has students last names SI through Z. Let's talk graduation requirements. You guys are the class of 2025. In order to graduate, there are some specific credits that you have to earn in order to graduate. You must have four credits of English, four credits of math, one being algebra and one being geometry, three credits of science, biology, and two more. The three specific credits of world history, of history, world history, U.S. history, the half credit of government and half credit of economics, two credits of world language, one credit of a practical or performing fine art, one credit of hope. This is the health opportunities through physical education, the state required PE class and six credits of electives. This is a total of 24 credits. You also have to meet some testing requirements. We must pass a reading test and a math test in order to graduate. In the reading test category, the first test that you'll take that would count for graduation is the 10th grade FSA reading. Alternatively, you could pass the SAT or ACT with the concordant scores, and that's basically a score we can use to substitute in. So you don't have to pass all three of these tests, just one out of the three in this reading category. In the math category, the math assessment that you are first given that would count for graduation is the Algebra 1 EOC. And you take this based on whenever you took or will take the, a the Algebra 1 class. You could have taken that seventh grade, eighth grade, maybe this year, potentially next year. And again, just like in the reading category, we have some substitute tests that we can use as concordant. We can use a geometry EOC, SAT math, ACT math, or the PSAT NMSQT, and we'll talk more about PSAT in just a minute. Outside of the credits and the two tests required for graduation, we also must have a minimum GPA of a 2.0 or better. We'll understand what that really means in a moment when we talk about GPA. And additionally, you have to pass an online course in order to graduate. Here at Atlantic Coast, most of our students will meet that requirement through the U.S. government or economics classes that they plan to take their senior year. As I mentioned, those are credits you must earn for graduation, but also the standard classes here at Atlantic Coast use a platform called Edgenuity, which is a web-based platform, and therefore the class is flagged as a web-based class and will earn you your online credit when you have passed that class. Uh, so most likely there won't be something additional you have to do here necessarily, but if you're interested in checking out some of the course offerings on Duval Flex or Florida Virtual School, you could certainly take a class, maybe one that we don't offer that looks interesting to you. So final grades, how are they calculated? And this is important because your final grades are what earns you a credit by having passed a class. So 
going back to those graduation requirements, those credits that you have to earn, you earn them based on getting passing grades. And so it's important to know how your grade is calculated. What we're looking here at is uh, semester one. And so semester one is worth a half credit. We'll see in a second, semester two is also worth a half credit. And in a moment, we'll also see that there are some classes that are graded on the full year. So we'll get to that in a second. But looking at semester one, this is the average of quarter one and quarter two grade books, along with a teacher midterm. Your quarter one grade book is the log of grades that you've earned on classwork, homework, projects, quizzes, and tests during the first nine weeks of school. Second quarter is the log of grades the same, uh, the same topics, your classwork, homework, projects, quizzes, and tests, but during the second nine weeks of school. So these two quarters being averaged together are worth 80% of your final grade. The other 20% comes from the teacher midterm, which could be a uh, project or an exam, and it is teacher created and graded. You'll see that the equation is down here at the bottom. Quarter one and quarter two, so you obviously will earn a letter grade based on whether, you know, 90 to 100 is an A, 80 to 89 is a B, and so forth. But we can't add letters together. We have to convert those back into numbers. So you'll see that an A is worth four points, a B is worth three, a C is worth two. So if a student got an A and a B for quarter one and quarter two, we would add a four plus three divided by two. So we get the average of the two quarters and multiply that times 0.8 because that's 80%. And then whatever letter grade you get on your exam or project for the midterm, again, we convert that letter to numbers. We give that number, we multiply that by 0.2 because it's worth 20%. So when we calculate that, that adds up to a number which is then converted back to a letter grade. Anything D or above will earn you the credit. An F is a fail and will always not earn you credit. So semester two is very similar to semester one. It's the quarter three and quarter four grade books. And in this time, it's a district EOC instead of a teacher final. So this is also worth 20%, but this is district created and graded. And so the equation is here. The average of quarter three and four is 80%. The district EOC makes up the other 20% of your grade. Here is the equation for full year classes. And there's not many. We only have four classes that are full year. And these are the courses that have a state end of course exam. So that would be algebra one, geometry, US history, and biology. We average the four quarter grades together. So quarter one, two, three, and four, add those up, divide by four, that's 70%. Because in this situation, that end of course exam is worth 30% of your final grade. And that state EOC is created and graded by the Florida Department of Education. Grade point average, so GPA, how is that calculated? GPA is calculated by final grades only and updated on a semester basis. So your, your report card grades or your progress report grades are not continuously updating your GPA. Your GPA is only updated at the end of a semester when a final grade is earned. Now that report card grade, as we just saw, your quarter one report card grade is gonna factor into what your semester one grade is because it's going to be averaged with quarter two. So it's going to make up part of the number of points that you've earned in order to earn that credit. Um, but your GPA is not calculated or recalculated every time a report card comes out. It's only calculated on the semester basis. And GPA is a matter of quality points divided by the number of credits you've attempted. So looking at quality points, Every final grade that you earn, earns you a number of quality points. The total number of quality points that you've earned cumulatively, that means we, we count everything from ninth to 12th grade. So your GPA is continuously adding up together all of the quality points that you've earned so far. So at the end of ninth grade first semester, it's just going to be the quality points that you've earned during this first semester. But then at the end of the year, it'll be 
the quality points from first semester plus the quality points from second semester. And then as we go on each year, we're just adding on every letter grade you get. We're adding more quality points. We're making that numerator uh, hopefully get higher and more significantly by earning A's, B's, and C's. So as you'll see, an A is worth four points, a B is worth three, a C is worth two, a D is worth one, F is always worth zero points. Now, credits attempted. Every class that you take is an attempted credit, and this is the denominator of your GPA. Um, just because you attempt a credit, however, doesn't mean you earn it. So remember, A's, B's, C's, and D's are the only grades that earn you credit. We're going to talk a minute in a minute about why a D isn't so great. But a semester, a semester-based class, which is everything outside of algebra, geometry, biology, and U.S. history, that's a half-credit attempt each semester. Those four full-year classes I just talked about, those are one-credit attempt, and it's calculated in at the end of the school year. So here's an example of a GPA calculation. Here's a screenshot of uh, some final grades that have been earned. And you'll see just to the right of the screenshot that I have listed full year quality points and semester quality points. So an A for the full year is worth the full four points. For the semester, because a semester is just half a year, then the quality points would be half, right? So an A for a semester is two points. Now, if I get an A for semester and an A for second, se second semester, I'll have my full four points for the year. Um, but the reason that we calculate GPA on the semester basis is because it actually gives us a more accurate GPA. If you earn an A for first semester and then a B for second semester, instead of having four points, you have three and a half. Um, and so this is important to understand. So you'll see here to the left in the example that next to each letter grade, I have assigned in red the point value, the number of quality points that were earned. And this student has a total of 32 and a half quality points. Now, a couple columns over, you'll see the credits attempted. And either for the semester-based classes, you'll see a half credit attempt for each semester, or in the case of algebra, geometry and biology, you'll see where it says that there is one credit attempted there. So we add those up and there are 11 credits attempted. So this student's GPA is 32 and a half quality points divided by 11 credits attempted. And that is a 2.95 GPA. So something I want you to note is that you'll see that at a C is worth two points. And if we have to maintain a 2.0 cumulative GPA, so from ninth to 12th grade, in order to graduate, that would be getting a C grade on average in all of our courses. Remember that a D will earn you a credit in a class, but it's worth one quality point. So if I got a D in every single class I took in high school, I would have a perfect 1.0 GPA and I could pass the tests that are required for graduation and have my online requirement, but my GPA would not be 2.0 and I would not be able to um, get a high school diploma. So it's important that we aim for A's, B's and C's. And as long as we keep a C, our minimum threshold, then we're going to keep that GPA above 2.0. So PSAT, SAT, and ACT, let's talk about what and why. The PSAT is the preliminary SAT. And this, uh, the test that you will take as a ninth grader is the PSAT 8-9. So it's a really a practice test because the PSAT that we're talking about right here is the National Merit Scholarship Qualifying Test which you'll take in your 10th and 11th grade years. It can be used as a practice run of the SAT, and that would be either one of these PSATs, the 8-9 or the NMSQT. It's a practice run of the SAT, providing insight on how you might perform on the SAT. However, and this is for the NMSQT, this test is also used to identify national merit scholars and award merit scholarships. So that's why we would take it. We would take it for the math concordance score, potentially, if we needed that. We would get the practice and feedback we need on studying for the SAT, and we're using it to potentially be eligible for National Merit Scholarship qualifications. It's taken in October. 
The test is two hours and 45 minutes. It measures reading, evidence-based reading and writing and math. And the score is on a scale of 160 to 760. Now the SAT versus the ACT. Basically, these two tests have similar functions. So why we take it? We use it for college admissions. We use it for merit-based scholarships, dual enrollment eligibility, and also senior leave eligibility and concordant for graduation. So many, many students, even those who are not college bound, may have a stake in why they would want to or need to take the SAT or the ACT. And you'll see here that essentially um, there's just, they're formatted differently is what it comes down to. Um, they don't necessarily cover all of the same topics. For example, the SAT has five reading passages where the ACT has four, but there's no science section on the SAT and there is one on ACT. The math, uh, the math subjects that are covered are similar, arithmetic, algebra one and two, geometry and trigonometry, but the SAT is going to cover data analysis, whereas the ACT is, cover, is covering probability and statistics. So which test you take really depends on what type of student you are and where you lean in terms of your stronger subjects. Um, you don't have to take both, you can take one or the other. Here in Duval County, our juniors take the SAT in April and the county actually pays for you to take the test. So there's nothing um, that you don't, you don't have to pay for it and it's on a normal school day. So a lot of our students will take the SAT and if they find that they um, you know, enjoy that format or they, they just need to study um, to maybe increase their score 50 to 100 points, then they would probably stay with the SAT and continue to try to strengthen there. However, if we really didn't do well on the SAT, we want to try our hand at the ACT, that is certainly an opportunity to do so. Something to keep in mind, and this is much further down the road, is that taking the SAT or the ACT more than three times doesn't necessarily help you in the college admissions process. So we really want to have studied and feel prepared before we take those tests. And that's one reason why the PSAT is so great because it does give you some feedback on what you can strengthen and how you can study to be ready. So let's talk about some of the opportunities you may have later on down the road, the things you could be eligible for. First step, dual enrollment. So this would be earning college credits while you're still in high school. There are grade level requirements. So for SLS, which is Strategies for Academic Success, it's like a freshman and college level elective course that helps you learn how to be successful in college classes. 10th graders in their second semester, so beginning 10th grade, second semester, you could take this course um, or as an 11th or 12th grader. All other academic dual enrollment classes, you have to be 11th or 12th grade in order to take the course. You also have to have a 3.0 unweighted GPA. And so right away, you should be three, you should be thinking, oh, a B is worth three points. So 3.0 means about a B average. There are some tests and cutoff scores you have to have. We don't have to have all three tests and all three um, categories here, but we have to have a qualifying reading and writing score. If we're taking a math class, we have to have a qualifying math test score. If we're not planning on taking a academic dual enrollment math class, we don't have to have the cutoff score, but we do have to at least have attempted the test. Um, and so we offer the PERT here at school for free. Uh, as a junior, you'll take the SAT here at school for free. If you want to take these dual enrollment classes in your junior year, then you may need to plan for taking the PERT test toward the end of your sophomore year. And then lastly, to take academic dual enrollment courses, you must have completed that SLS course within the first two semesters of taking an academic dual enrollment. So you could certainly go ahead and get it out of the way, second semester of 10th grade, um, or if you're going to take some academic dual enrollment classes in the 11th or 12th grade, you just need to take that SLS class within the first two semesters of doing so. 
Senior partial schedule. I know that seems really far away, but this can maybe give you something to aspire to in order to have a partial schedule your senior year in which you only have to attend uh, school for the classes that you still need for graduation. Uh, so you would have a shortened day. You would need to promote to senior, have a 2.0 or higher unweighted GPA, passed the reading and math assessments for graduation, you must have passed an AP exam or be a dual, uh, enrolled in a dual enrollment course by the fall of your senior year. And that SLS class does count, so you don't necessarily have to take academic dual enrollment classes. You must be post-secondary ready in reading and math. Those are those cutoff scores that we just saw for the dual enrollment. It's the same, same test, same, same cutoff scores. And have your own transportation. For our college bound student athletes, NCAA eligibility, if you're planning or thinking you may want to enroll in a division one or division two school, then at some point you're gonna to need to register with the NCAA eligibility center. They have some really great resources on there for student athletes, um, but you can also double check the QR code below um, to review what courses count for NCAA eligibility here at Atlantic Coast. About 99% of our courses here do count, um, but there are a couple of math or science classes where a student may have to take an extra or a different math or science class in order to maintain that eligibility. And if you have any questions about that, you could see your counselor and we can help you out with that. Bright Future Scholarship Eligibility. So this is a merit-based scholarship that is really great. There's a couple of designations. Um, and the scores and GPAs that you'll see listed here are these um, requirements are for the class of 2022 and the class of 2023. Your award designations and those requirements will be made available to you by your junior year. Um, so these are something to keep in mind as a ballpark. Typically, the GPA doesn't change and the community service hours have not changed either, but what can fluctuate would be those SAT or ACT scores. So the academic scholar pays 100% of your tuition and fees at a public school. Um, this scholarship will also cover your, your tuition and fees for a private school, but not 100%. It'll cover a dollar amount per credit hour, and depending on how um, expensive the private school is, that may be 40 to 50% of your tuition and fees. You would have to have a 3.5 weighted GPA in the 16 core classes. So they're not calculating everything. They're specifically looking at the four English, four math, three social studies, three science, and the two world language. The SAT is a 1330 and the, the ACT is a 29. And you have to have 100 hours of community service, which you can begin and should begin working on now. Medallion Scholar is 75% of tuition and, and fees at a public school. And again, a dollar amount per credit hour at private school. 3.0 weighted GPA in the same 16 core classes. It's a 1210 SAT, a 25 ACT, and 75 hours of community service. And please understand that with regard to community service, Bright Futures specifically need is, is um, defining community service as something that was free and available to the public and that served a social need. It cannot be something that's for a for-profit business or politically or religiously affiliated. Um, so we'll be putting out some more information about that, but you, if you ever have a question about something that you're thinking about donating or volunteering your time to that you want to use for Bright Futures eligibility, this would be something you may want to clear with your counselor before you do so. All right, in wrapping up, scholarships, when do I apply? Well, now, actually, believe it or not, here are some great websites, goingmary.com, scholarships.com, and fastweb.com. While you're in high school, you should really be applying to three to five scholarships each month. Um, if you did so starting in ninth grade, by the time you're a senior, you might actually have your entire college expense paid for through scholarships, which would be great because scholarships are money that you don't have to pay back. So you do want to come out of college debt free. Um, and any money that you have that you have that is over what is required for tuition, the school would actually send you a check 
for you to use that money as you uh, as you need to. So whether it's for books, rent, food, whatever it is while you're in college, you would have that money and it's not money that you would have to pay back. Something to keep in mind here is a lot of students try to get one big scholarship at $40,000 and that's great and that would be wonderful, but you and every other student would love to do that. So they're highly competitive. What gets overlooked often are these smaller scholarships, the ones that are $500, $1,000, $1,500. And so this is why the recommendation is that you should be applying to three to five of these smaller scholarships every month while you're in high school, because you may not get every one that you apply to, but if you could even rack up 10 of these or 15 of these, you may have a full year or maybe even two years of your college paid for. And so it's worthwhile to do so. Your high school timeline, what should you be doing and when? So everything I've talked about could be pretty overwhelming and I wanna help just try to condense it down to, yes, this is the big picture. This is everything that um, is coming on down the road as you move through your high school journey. But what can you be focusing on right now? In the ninth grade, it's really about getting involved and getting familiar with high school, establishing good study skills and organizational skills, discovering your interests. What is it that you're interested in? What is most important to you? What do you value? What are you really good at? Focus on passing your classes and responding to your areas of growth. So the areas where maybe they aren't your strengths and they are something that you could grow and make stronger. Respond to those. 10th grade, maintain those good grades, set goals, pass your graduation reading test, develop your interest. So continue not only to discover them, but start doing things that develop your interest even more and set you apart from your classmates. And here also respond to your areas of growth. 11th grade is a big year. This is where you consider your post-secondary plans, which means your after high school plans. Study for and take the SAT and ACT. Get exposure to colleges and trade schools or military recruiters. Maintain good grades, strengthen your interests, and continue growing. 12th grade is sort of the party. This is where you execute those post-secondary plans. So you're either doing those college applications or seriously talking with a military recruiter or uh, submitting registration information for a trade school. Celebrate your success and finish strong. So we'll wrap up with this. Success is the sum of small efforts repeated day in and day out. Robert Collier. So keep that in mind, Stingray freshmen, as you continue on to your high school journey, it can be overwhelming to look at the whole. However, if you just focus on what you're doing on a daily basis, you'll be successful.